Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is um, this is a, a fun program for me because I try to put together a number of things that that we that we teach in a two week program in the Job Search Accelerator uh, session for J JVS. Uh, so I'm going to give some introductions and myself and, and others, and then we'll we'll talk about three primary things we're going to talk about this morning. Um, we're going to talk give just tips basically about putting together the resume, the cover letter, and ATS. And if you see on the slide, uh, keywords is there, and that that's really what so much of this is about. If we if we do a really good job at targeting a resume, we've already covered a lot to put together the cover letter. And we've definitely covered a lot to, to get through the applicant tracking system. So we're going to talk about all of those things. Um, uh, hopefully, you can see my slide. Matthew, can you see my slide? We good? Great, thank you. So this is me. I'm David Robbins. Uh, I'm the senior instructor for the Job Search Accelerator program. I've been working at, at JVS for uh, almost 13 years. Um, and in that time, I've been teaching all the different job search skills uh, in our public workshops and then moved into the Job Search Accelerator program. I went full time with that and then also became a career advisor, which I had some experience before I came to JVS. So uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a really heartwarming job for me to help people find their next employment, whether it's something that's a, a, a new job coming back to an existing career path or pivoting. So it's, it's a, lot of, uh, a lot of good feelings working one-on-one -on -one with our clients. So JVS is, is an organization uh, that, that's been around for over 40 years. Um, we provide free job training services. We, we specialize in the unemployed and underemployed people. And most of our programs build in-demand skills. So we work with corporate partners and find out what kind of skills do you need? And we help teach those skills. Uh, we make connections for our clients and help people land great jobs. We're funded by the government and private donations <clears throat> and corporate sponsors. We're completely non-sectarian. Um, we, the, the J in JVS stands for Jewish. We're called Jewish Vocational Service. But we've always been, in, throughout the 40 plus years that we've been in existence, we've been completely non-sectarian. Um, we're headquartered in San Francisco. <clears throat> um, some people, some programs are offered around the Bay Area, those that are uh, now meeting again face-to-face. -face. Uh, the program I'm gonna be talking about primarily today is, is uh, for, the, for the near future, is going to stay in a virtual environment, which makes it easy for the clients and safe for everybody. So this is the program, the Job Search Accelerator program. Um, it's a great way to relaunch or kick off your job search. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of things that are included in the program. Um, it's all synchronous. It's job search essential training. And synchronous meaning that you're going to have a live instructor the whole way through. We do have a lot of materials. Uh, we, we use Google Classroom. And all the materials that we use are then shared and owned by the people who attend the program. So there is an application process and the application will be available online, hopefully tomorrow, but by Monday the latest. And that will be for the next session, which will be starting in, looking at my calendar, May 13th, and we'll run two weeks. So it'll run till May 27th. Um, after the program, you get ongoing support, both from the cohort that you build in the people who are attending the program all at the same time. And then their post-training services, including career advisors for up to one year, usually about 90 days. And most of our people will then uh, be successful in finding something, um, but we'll continue supporting people up to one year. So uh, we call it a two week program, but it's actually a one year program. A mock interviewing, resume, uh, cover letter, networking skills, all of the different skills are covered in the two week program. Uh, we meet in the mornings and then we take a break and then we have an hour again in the afternoon. Um, there's a link here that will take you to the Job Search Accelerator. We'll explain more about it. 
Uh, this might be talking about the March program that just completed, but uh, the next program will be online and updated by hopefully by Monday. So you're here not to hear about the commercial, so the commercial's over. But let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Um, we have three sections from for this program. One, we're going to talk about the resume, uh, how to prepare to create it. Uh, a lot of people go right into the resume and say, here's what a resume should look like. And they, and they talk about how beautiful it would be. But we have to tell you that the beauty of the resume is not what recruiters and hiring managers are looking for. What they're looking for is a resume that tells them you understand what it is that the hiring manager wants, what the hiring manager needs, and that you can actually accomplish that when you get hired. So it's really a content driven program. So we're going to talk about how to prepare to create it, what's important to go into the resume, and then we're going to talk about industry standard formatting. Um, we'll take questions after that. So as we have questions, please put them in the chat. Lori will be watching the chat. And when we get to the question part, we'll uh, have Lori read out some of the questions that you have from the chat. Uh, after we read that, that first section, after we get through the first section, uh, we're going to get into cover letters. Why do we use a cover letter? What are the, what's the format of a cover letter? And uh, do you send the cover letter in the old days? You typed it on a typewriter and put the header and put it on your fancy paper. We don't do that anymore. Usually sending it as an email. So we want to make sure we understand what that's about. And um, who, who is really looking at the cover letter and who's not caring about it? We want to talk about that. There is a reality that a lot of people don't care about cover letters. But if you just out of hand say, I'm not going to do cover letters, they take too long, they're a pain, they just say the same thing I said in my resume, you're missing the point. So you have a lot of opportunity in a cover letter, so we want to talk about that. And then uh, when your resume is sent in through, um, through the internet, usually most companies now are using um, the applicant tracking system, the ATS system. And it does two things. It tracks who is applying for what positions. And then the recruiters and or hiring managers can actually set up filters on an applicant tracking system to eliminate people who they could see right away are not qualified. So they get hundreds of applications and there's a good percentage of applications that come in for a particular job that people just saw a title and sent in a resume. And that is not gonna get through an applicant tracking system that has filters in it. We should have time for questions all the way through. And again, please put the questions in the chat. So I'm gonna get started. Um, tips, these are tips, we're not, the detail, the detail is in, uh, um, what do you say, the devil's in the detail. <laughs> but we're not going to get into too much of the detail, but we're going to spend a little bit of time, particularly on resume, because I think that is going to give us the tip that's going to help us with cover letters and the ATS system. <clears throat> First thing, who's your audience for the resume? So uh, the, the thought is uh, that the hiring manager is the audience. Well, well, wait, we know that before the hiring manager sees it, the recruiter sees it. Um, and sometimes after the recruiter sees it, someone in HR might see it. And sometimes there's a saucer, which is somebody who's looking at, for example, your LinkedIn profile. You don't even send in a resume. They're looking for people who have qualifications, even if you haven't applied for the job. So there are a lot of different people who are looking for you or looking at what you submit in an application. So um, the hiring manager, is in fact telling you what they want and what they need. And that's usually in the job post. Now, we at, at JVS talk a lot about the fact that most people do look at job boards and look at job posts. And that's a great way to understand what the hiring manager is looking for. But don't only depend on that in your job search. So just another tip on a different topic, but networking is so important in job search. And uh, we talk about that when we talk about our um, LinkedIn programs that I teach also here at the library. So the first thing is, who's your audience? Um, you're gonna get uh, 
job description. So here's a job description that came. This is this was a real one. University of California, San Francisco. Uh, this was for an administrative assistant. The job code was administrative assistant two. And this is in the Psychiatry Alliance Health Project of UCSF. And then it tells us what the job overview is and a little more about the company or the organization. Uh, remember that companies are selling you on the job because they want you to apply. Important to read this also. And then a little more about UCSF and then qualifications that are down below. So we want to take a look at this and say, what's the first step in putting together your job description? Um, excuse me, but putting together your resume. So the first thing is to analyze this job description. You want to make sure that you can, in fact, um, identify the duties of the job. So some people take a look at the title and they say, oh, I could do that. I've done that before. And they sent in a generic resume saying how wonderful they are. But they're actually telling you the duties for this particular job. So that's what the analysis is so important for. Uh, you're going to analyze the duties of the job. And you should match probably 70 to 75% of these duties in your experience. You should be able to do these because that's what your job is going to be about. Now, the other thing is, it's going to tell you what the requirements are. And if you don't match 90% of the requirements, um, it's okay to send in an application, but don't hold it in high regard that this is going to happen because there are other people that are matching the requirements at 100%. So they're telling you what the requirements are. Now, I'm not gonna tell you to eliminate yourself if you match 100% of the duties in your resume and 80% of the requirements, yeah, give it a shot. Maybe they still like you. So there are a few more things that we want to talk about in analyzing the job description. And one is, what's the culture of the organization? Because this also should be something that you match on your resume. So the analysis of the job description and then beyond the job description, the website, um, any uh, social media uh, about the company, all of these things are part of your analysis before you even write a resume. And then you have to think back through your own job history because you have a lot of transferable skills that may be appropriate in putting together a resume. So what could make you stand out that you can put on your resume, something that we call your special source or make you the unicorn. So in order to show you um, how we do this and how we teach it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take each piece of this one piece at a time. Here again is the job description. And I'm going to just focus here on the job overview to see what are the tasks that the hiring manager is telling you you need to be able to perform. So here's the job overview. And I highlighted in red, what are the things that we could identify? And we might wanna actually write down on a sheet of paper, here are the things that they're asking me to be able to do. I'm gonna be the um, initial point of contact for a member of the, of the, comp of the uh, public. I'm gonna greet walk-ins to the building. I'm gonna provide them needed information or contact the appropriate staff or clinician. Um, I'm going to answer all incoming telephone calls and direct those calls as appropriate. I'm going to provide administrative support to the clinical activities on site. And I have to be able to interact pleasantly with a wide variety of personalities and have flexibility to perform well under shifting demands. Pretty much almost everything that was written in here is what you would be able to have to identify that you have this kind of experience. So that's the first thing that you would look at. Now, you can't stop there because there are other pieces. So we said the first thing is to look at the job duties. The next is to look at the requirements. So where would you find the requirements? Usually it would say required or a primary requirement. So there'll be some other word here. And here's what we look at here. <clears throat> The required qualifications for this job, three years, directly related administrative experience, 
or a combination of education and experience. Spanish language proficiency is not just a want, it's a requirement. And minimum one year work experience using uh, basically uh, the PC. Not, not too bad, not a lot there. Those are things that um, just about everybody here in the room probably has one year working experience with PCs, but three years of directly related administrative experience or a combination of related education experience might be something that you consider. If I don't have that, are they really going to give me a second look? Uh, maybe I have one year of directly related experience. Well, again, if I have everything else, maybe I could still apply to that job and think you're thinking about all this before you even write the resume. The next thing is you're looking at the next section, which are the preferred qualifications, because these are the things that they're asking for, but they're not making it required. So um, these are the things that might make you stand out as a unicorn, special sauce. Uh, previous UCSF work experience, uh, minimum six months working in a facility serving multicultural populations, diverse in gender and sexual orientation. That might be a little tougher, but it's something that would help raise you up in the, in the queue. And then, of course, excellent verbal, telephone, and written communication skills, because a lot of the things that are your job, talking on the phone, greeting people as they walk into the, into the site. Now, there's one more thing you want to look at, and that is there's another section um, that is both uh, telling you about the, the Alliance Health Project, the AHP. And uh, I have to tell you, when I would teach this, teach this with my clients, um, after we go through all of this, I would then say to them, so what is the AHP? And they all go, I, I, I. And that's because they didn't even read this section of the job description. The AHP is the Alliance Health Project. If you look at the top, the department is in psychiatry and it's the Alliance Health Project. So these are the things that you can't miss in analyzing a job description. So this tells you a lot about what's important to UCSF and the work that they're doing in this position. Um, and then there's more information about UCSF in general. So all of this becomes information that you should analyze and identify. And, and yes, I say even write it down somewhere saying, okay, here are the four things I was looking for. Um, here, here are the job duties. Here are the requirements. Um, here's a little bit about the culture of the organization right here. And here's what might make me a special sauce to preferred qualifications down here. Okay, now that you have all that, what do you do? Now you have to start step two. You're not gonna start writing your resume until you write the top of your resume. Now they say that hiring managers are known as top third readers. They usually only read the top third of a resume before they give it to somebody saying, okay, this guy looks good, check her out. Uh, so you wanna catch their attention in the top of the resume by letting them know that you are a good candidate for what they described as their needs and wants. So this is an actual response by Samuel Hernandez. Um, well, the contact information, of course, is false. Uh, bilingual health professional with 15 years of public health and administrative ex uh, experience. I think they asked for how many years? They asked for three years. This person saying, I have 15 years of administrative uh, experience. So right away that says, okay, this person we know has experience as an admin, compassionately serving the San Francisco HIV AIDS and LGBTQ communities. I didn't see that in the duties or the requirements, HIV AIDS and LGBTQ. But in the description of the Alliance Health Project, it said that that's the focus of this project, supporting HIV, AIDS, and LGBT communities uh, in the UCSF environment. So 
in doing that analysis, you now know to put that right in the top of your resume. So that's the, what, what many people call the branding statement. This tells you, this tells the reader something about you, kind of generalized, but specific to the job description. And then if you go through each of these uh, six bullets, you'll notice they all relate to something that was identified in the job description uh, that, that Samuel Hernandez was reading and analyzing. Extensive experience providing agency information and support to diverse populations. So it did ask for diverse populations. Excellent customer facing telephone and written communication skills. It asked for that, both in the preferred qualifications, but also in the job duties. Um, flexible and adaptable. Flexible is a word that was used. Performs well under shifting demands. Samuel probably took that right out of the job description and put it into the top of his resume. Proficient in Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Now, many of us think, well, that's not important. Everybody knows that, but they called it out. Good for you to respond to it. Now, the other thing is um, strong English, Spanish, bilingual proficiency. It did ask for that. It was a requirement to be Spanish literate. So in the, in the branding statement at the top, bilingual, that's fine. But here, we're very specific, English, Spanish bilingual proficiency. Now, the one thing I didn't talk about is this uh, fifth bullet, familiar with UCSF policies. Now it, it asked for, um, not just familiar with, it said um, experience with UCF, UCSF. That was a preferred qualification, right? Samuel Hernandez kind of twisted that. Because what do people see when they scan? They don't read this word for word. They scan and they're looking for the keywords they're looking for. And one of the keywords they're looking for was UCSF. And he, he gave it to them right here, UCSF policies. He said he's familiar with them, which again is probably close enough. And then he added some special sauce. Now, I, I think that there are many of you in the room who know what HIPAA is, right? This is the privacy regulation that all health organizations have to abide by. It wasn't mentioned anywhere on the job description, but Samuel Hernandez knew that he's familiar with HIPAA and the organization is going to be a little bit impressed with the fact that he understands HIPAA, even though they never mentioned it. That's what might make him a unicorn. That's the special sauce. Okay, I'm gonna catch my breath here. So what happened from the analysis to the step two, creating eye-catching professional summary? Um, Samuel Hernandez did not start writing a resume. What he did is he focused on the top of the resume. And he said, I'm gonna try to let them know in the top of the resume that I am a very good candidate for this position. Now, does he have to continue? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> he has to now complete the resume. But the other thing is everything that's in this section here now has to be proved in the experience section. He has to show that he really used Spanish somewhere in his experience. He has to show that he provided agency information somewhere in his experience. He has to show that he had customer-facing experience somewhere in his experience. So by putting this together first, it helps you identify what's important in your experience section as you get to the next step. So step one, analyze the job description. Step two, create that professional summary or the top of the, of the resume. Step three, complete the rest of the resume. How do you do that? Well, you've already put in your contact information. That was at the top. Um, your summary of qualifications, that's what we just focused on. And now you have to come up with your experience and you want to use accomplishment statements in your experience. Now, I know some people like to add a skills section in your resume, which is sometimes interesting if you have room for it. But we work with a recruiter advisory council at JVS and, and they're all very clear you tell me that you have certain skills, 
I don't know if I believe that until you show me that you actually use those skills in your jobs, which means that they want to see your accomplishment statement and they'll be able to see that you actually use those skills. So they want to see the skills in context, not just a list of skills. I actually have a client that the entire first page of her resume is competencies and skills, lists of those. And I explained to her, nobody's going to look at the first page. They're just going to skip over it and go right to the experience section because they want to see what that means. So you want to have your accomplishment statements. We're going to talk about what an accomplishment statement is. And then, of course, your education, which is not just your education, but any certifications that you have, any honors that you've had. If there are classes that are appropriate, that are pertinent and relevant to the job, you might include some of the classes. Uh, one thing um, for people my age, you don't have to put down any dates for when you graduated school. So people are, are always worried about ageism. That's going to happen later in the month. We'll talk about that. But um, you don't have to, on a resume, put the dates anymore for when you graduate. Um, you, you could put down dates of your certifications, especially if they're more recent, because that says to an employer that you are um, still learning that you're still improving, that you have a learner's mind. And that's also important for the um, hiring manager to see. A couple of other tips about putting together the rest of your resume. Um, you don't want to have a photo or any personal information on a US resume. Now, I know in Europe, they want a photo. They want your marital status. They want uh, your blood type. They want how many children you have. Um, if you have a photo on a US resume, many times the recruiter will actually shred it uh, because they do not want to be biased when they're looking at that. So don't have a photo. We don't need it. It's not expected. Um, some people have a lot of experience. I mean, I've been working since the 1800s, so I have a lot of experience, but um, you want to stay with two pages because what they're looking for is relevant experience for this job. And you just did the analysis so you know what is relevant. Uh, so you want to pretty much stay with two pages. Sometimes if you have to go into a third page, particularly in science or, or um, higher education, if you're looking for a professorship, then you're usually using a different format, using a, a curriculum vitae or a CV format, which is different from a US resume. Um, each resume, not just one resume for everything, each resume is targeted to each job using appropriate keywords and phrases. So that's one of the important lessons to learn. Um, having a generic resume saying how wonderful you are, many times doesn't even get through an ATS system because you didn't do the analysis to identify what the keywords are that the ATS system is looking for that now Samuel Hernandez came up with right here and pretty much met all the requirements for meeting all those keywords. So you want to make sure that you have uh, a resume targeted to each job description. Doesn't mean you have to always write it from scratch because your experience is your experience, but you may actually start changing the level, the, the sequence of bullets that are underneath each experience, depending on what it is that was highlighted in the job description for that particular job. Okay, then you're going to put together your resume. There are two standard formats for resume. <clears throat> There's the, the functional, what people call a functional, um, and then the chronological. Now, I added the word hybrid, and I'm including a link to an article that, said, that, that says why recruiters hate functional resume. Because a purely functional resume doesn't give enough information for them. It just says, here's how wonderful I am, and it doesn't give any information that they need. A hybrid resume is different. It's, it's somewhere between a functional and a chronological. But the chronological is the format of resume that most hiring managers and recruiters are used to seeing. It's what they're used to getting. They don't have to search for information. They know what's going to be coming because the, stand, the, the, um, the, the format is pretty standard. And at JVS, what we teach in the Job Search Accelerator program is staying with a very simplified format, 
so that the recruiter can find the information they're looking for right off the top. And it's easy to scan with a lot of white space. So what do you need in a, in a resume? I think you all know this. The first top of the resume is going to be your name and your contact information. A couple of things that are important. Um, you don't need to have your home address. Nobody's coming to your house and they're not sending you a letter. So what you need to have is your name. You need to have city and state. You don't need a zip code because that again could deal with some bias when they know a zip code relates to a particular part of a city, which, which might lead to a demographic. Um, so your name, your city state, um, and then your phone number, your email address, and your LinkedIn address. Those are the things that you should always include at the top of your resume. That's your contact information. Your phone number should be your phone that you answer. Your email address should not be something that you used years ago, like pretty in pink at AOL.com. Change it, get a new one, uh, get away from Hotmail and AOL, because that are also says you, you've been uh, looking at email addresses uh, much too long. So go for something that's Yahoo or Google. Um, but that's the top, and that's pretty standard at the top of a resume. Uh, the next section, again, standard, is that summary of qualifications, what we call the top of the resume. And we just showed you what that would look like with the Samuel Hernandez example. Please use that if you want to um, you know, copy that kind of format that we found is uh, very helpful to the recruiters as they're scanning through a resume. Um, now, if you're in tech, you might want to um, combine that summary of qualifications with a list of your skills and uh, languages, because uh, that makes it easy for them to see that particularly if it's called out as requirements, you wanna make sure that you're gonna put that in. So tech sometimes, rather than a summary of qualifications would say tech skills and put some of that tech information down. The next section is your experience. And there you want to use accomplishment statements, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And that again, that could go more than the, the bottom of the page. It could go onto a second page. If you're going to have two pages, make sure that um, on the second page you have some a bit of your contact information, because if they print those two pages out and they get separated, they want they need to know that the second page goes along with with you. So you want to make sure you have contact information somewhere on that second page. And then the bottom part of a resume usually is education. Um, in addition to the schools that you might have graduated from, degrees that you have, you could put down uh, what are your languages that you speak, particularly if it's called out, certifications that you have that are relevant to this job position. You could also have here, if you have room on your resume, volunteering. 60% of hiring managers like people who volunteer. There are many companies that actually give their employees free time to volunteer. So um, all of that, and then any professional associations you might belong to, all of this at the bottom can go together under something that says education and certifications. So that's your standard format for a resume. And again, we promote the chronological, but if you think that um, as people, again, with my experience say that um, the chronological, if I'm looking for a new corporate training position, I worked 16 years at Hewlett Packard, but it was a long time ago. So chronologically, it would be down at the bottom of my resume. So I might want to use a hybrid format and move some of my experience and my accomplishments up closer to the top of the resume, but still explain where I got that experience from at the bottom. So um, I'll give you an article about the hybrid, but we don't spend a lot of time on dealing with that format. So I promised you we'd talk about accomplishment statements. So um, we find that many people will just put in, in their, in their experience, they'll put in something that almost looks like a job description. Uh, cover the phones for, for, the, uh, for the company. That, what does that mean? How many calls did you get a day? Uh, how many, what did you do when you covered the phone? What did you do with the information? So there's more you could deal with. 
So here is the idea of this is a, a target job skill in the art director, working and influencing in a cross-functional context, leveraging research and data to inform the design of the experience. Okay, this is what's called out. Now, if you're familiar with star stories, you should have a star story written for this, and then you can adapt that into a resume bullet. But the other way to do that is to think of it in these, these steps. Um, do I have this experience? Well, yes, um, I had a visual lookbook for international streetwear, bear, streetwear brand. Um, and the result was it helped people stay on brand. It highlighted and showcased and stay true to the original design and client vision, which is kind of what they're asking for here. And then I want to make sure that I start the bullet with an action verb. So conceptualized or collaborated, I can use either one of those that might work because it says cross-functional context. Collaboration might be something I want to point out. So here I can put it together in a sentence form. Created a visual lookbook with art director in Japan, resulting in consistent design collaboration for three consecutive years. Metrics, very helpful in an accomplishment statement as it is in a star story. Collaborated with an art director in Japan to create a visual lookbook for a streetwear brand, which resulted in dot, dot, dot. Or conceptualized and visual lookbook, conceptualized a visual lookbook for Japanese international wear brand, leveraging research and market data, staying true to client design. Any one of those would be a good bullet that speaks to this. Does it say what skills you had? Well, if you look at the any one of these three created, well, that's a skill right there, right? Uh, be able to create something. Um, working with the art director in Japan. So there's a skill working with an international, uh, um, an, inter, an international contact person that I'm collaborating and the result consistent design collaboration for three consecutive years. And that's the result. So that gives a metric that says, this actually was important. If it went on for three years, it was actually working. So the skills don't have to be called out in particular, they actually exist inside the accomplishment statement. Um, I think I have another one. Nope, I have just one. But I do have this resource for you, why recruiters hate the functional resume. So um, if, you, if you click on this, you'll get uh, an article that was written actually by JobScan. Uh, JobScan is an, a, an application that emulates the applicant tracking system. And you can use it to test your resume against a job description. Um, I, don't, I don't hold it in 100% valid results, but it's a good way to get a first look at your resume and whether you're, you're hitting those keywords. Um, I would recommend that you look at this article and you'll see again why a functional resume is not acceptable anymore, what a hybrid resume is, and then a chronological resume, and then it tells you a little bit about the applicant tracking system, which we're going to get to in the next section. Okay, so I wanted to give you that resource, and now any questions about Resumes. Uh, David, I don't see any question in the chat. Um, if you if you have question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, Matthew, Matthew I, Talbot. Matthew Talbot has a question. Oh, he makes some statement. I can read. I can read them out loud. Okay. Uh, Matthew wrote, um, "I've used content directly uh, from website of the employer uh, verbatim." Um, so he, he did exactly what um, you were uh, suggesting us to do. And also he- oh, He's saying no. Uh, Matthew, why, why don't no. you, why, can you unmute yourself? No. Oh, let, let me, let me um, allow him to unmute. Yeah, uh, Matthew, go ahead. You can unmute yourself now. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I was just um, wondering whether, you know, a long-winded resume, resume, or just kind of more directly to the point is preferable. Well, they don't care about long-winded because remember, their first look at a resume is about six seconds. 
So um, what they're looking for is what they're looking for. They're not looking for all the things that you want to tell them about yourself. They only are interested in what, in what they are looking for, which they put into the job description, uh, which is here's, here's what your job is going to be. Do you have experience with that? Here are the requirements. Do you have experience with that? Um, here's our culture. Is this going to be a good match for you? And then if there's anything extra that you can add to that, that talks about things that, um, that you might have gotten from the website or uh, looking through um, uh, Indeed or you know, other social media to find out more about the organization. But lo long-winded, they're not interested in. And, and me telling them how wonderful I am. I mean, I was the president of Theater Bay Area for six years. I'm very proud of that. They don't care that I was the president of Theater Bay Area unless I'm applying for a theater position or, or a board of directors position. So again, I have a lot of experience that is not no longer appropriate for jobs I might be looking for as, as a career advisor, as a job skills instructor. So you wanna to stay to the point. And yes, concise, concise, concise is very important. Okay, and well, as you customize each resume for the particular job that you're interested in. Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, we call it a targeted resume. Yeah. Okay, now right. if, you're, if you're just sending a resume off to say a staffing agency, um, you, you're gonna have something that is more generic because you don't have a job description giving you keywords, but it still has to be focused on what you're asking the staffing agency to look for for you, which means you're gonna to need to know a lot more about what kinds of organizations are looking for people that have my experience. And that, that's, how you, that's the closest you would get to a generic resume. But if you have a job description, definitely target it to the resume. I mean, that's definitely target your resume to the job description. Great. Okay. okay, hope that helps. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions that came up? Yes, Roy? yes, uh, we have a few. Um, so this one was uh, sent to me directly. Um, question is, is certificate of attendance or completion enough if, for example, you have completed attending a workshop? Um, they're not gonna, you're not gonna put that really on a, on a resume anyway. And um, if you are, let's say you're in a program that's going to, uh, that's going to last six months, um, there's nothing wrong with saying, um, putting the dates there. So let's say it's now, we're, we're now still in March. So I could put down, um, the, this is the certification and it goes from January to June of 2022. So that lets them know that I haven't completed it yet, but I'm working on it. And that's really what they're interested in, that you have a learner's mindset and that you're, you're, you're working on something that is relevant to what they're looking for. So you don't have to have, and they're not gonna ask you for a certificate of completion on your resume anyway. That's gonna come up after you get invited. And that'll, that's a whole different story. Okay, a question from Lily. How do you deal with a gap of not working due to being stay-at-home mom? Um, you put down on your resume, what did you do while you were a stay-at-home mom? So um, there's, there's nothing wrong with, and I've seen a number of articles about this now. It's something that, that I've been talking about for, for a good number of years. Um, uh, one of my clients came up with the word sabbatical. You know, when, when professors take time off from work, it's called a sabbatical. When you take time off from work, you go, oh no, it's a gap. No, it's actually a sabbatical. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with saying um, sabbatical to, uh, to, to focus on family care. Uh, and that could be someone who's ill, that could be a, a childcare, that could be uh, an aging parent, right? But the other thing is, what did you do during that time? Now, we have two grown children. I know that my wife actually took some time off from work, uh, but during that time, she was the president of the PTA and they raised $30,000 that year. That's an accomplishment that goes right on your resume. So they don't care whether it's paid experience, volunteer experience, 
or experience while you were in your what you call a gap. Put down what you did and show that you have professional experience even in that gap. Now I have to tell you also for those of you that maybe got laid off because of COVID, every recruiter and hiring manager understands a gap from March of 2020 to the current day. Uh, so if that's your gap, uh, don't worry about it. There are other ways you can actually uh, identify that that's uh, because of a COVID layoff. So there are a number of ways to deal with it. Uh, more and more when we talk to our recruiters, they don't care that you have a gap. What they care about is after the gap, have you studied? Have you brought your skills back up? Have you, um, have you done volunteer work, right? What kind of professional experience that, that have you had while you were in that gap? Um, where gap becomes a problem is people who work for six months at a job, then six months of a gap, and then eight months at a job, and two years as a gap, and then one year at a job, and then another gap. That's the problem that people see. And that's where you really have to work with a career advisor to figure out how can I talk about that really and make it look as if I'm, I'm actually a good candidate for this job. So I hope that helps with gaps. Thank you, David. Um, this question from Emily, uh, what is a good length when I have decades of experience? What is a good what? Uh, what is a good length when I have decades of experience? I think she meant um, how many years of experience should she list on her resume? That, oh. Yeah, I think if, if uh, Emily, oh. you can unmute yourself and uh, if, yeah. I, if I interpret it wrong. Uh, you know, I, I, I hear, um, and some of my colleagues actually talk about it saying, don't have more than 10 years of experience on, on your resume, which. Um, oh, in, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, David, <laughs> I interpreted it wrong. Uh, Emily explained, how long should my resume be? How many pages? Yeah, maximum two pages. And, and as far as how many years you go back, uh, remember the word relevant. Right. I, um, again, I'm, I'm not going to put down all of my experience because it would be a six page resume. Um, they don't care about all that experience. What they want to know is what's your relevant experience. And um, if you could get it onto one page, I have to tell you, people who've, who, who have as much experience as I have rarely can get everything down onto one page unless they're really pivoting to something new and they can really identify just relevant experience that will fit onto one page. Um, I have a two page resume. I could, as I said, fill a six page resume, but all of that stuff doesn't matter anymore. Um, so two page resume is about the max. Um, our recruiters say that if there's a third page, it's there, they might see it, they might not even look at it. Thank you, David. Question sent directly to me. Um, <clears throat> there was some mention of, um, I'd like to ask, what is a star? Oh, okay. Uh, what is a star story? Okay, so <laughs> there's a whole section on that. I thought a lot of people do know what that is. Star, um, and it's some, some called a sore story or a par story. Um, star stands for um, situation or task, action and result. So it's basically three sections that when you look at um, your experience, you try to describe it in terms of a quick statement of context, one or two sentence maximum, and then a list of the actions you took to accomplish something, and then what was the result? So situation or task, actions, and result. Star stories are important because it'll help you put together your resume, but they're extremely important when you're dealing with uh, interviewing. So uh, you want to have star stories ready for your interview because they're going to ask you questions like, tell me of a time that you had to overcome a challenge. They want to know an experience you've had overcoming a challenge. So that's where you would have a star story about that. Okay, I'm gonna hold any other questions till the end. Let, let me talk about the other, we have two more sections to cover. And um, I think that the important thing is that you understand how to analyze the job descriptions because it's, it's gonna help you in everything else that we're gonna cover now. So cover letters, still a big debate. <laughs> Should there be a cover letter? Should there not be a cover letter? 
Does anybody care about cover letters? Um, all of the recruiters that we that we uh, queried last time in our quarterly recruiter advisory council meeting, none of them look at cover letters. They just said, we, we don't look at them, we don't ask for them, and we don't look at them, which gives you one tip. If they don't ask for a cover letter, then it's probably your choice. But I then went out to LinkedIn and put a survey up and tried to see, because I had other information from other readings that I've had, and it comes down to 60% of hiring managers never look at a cover letter. 40% of hiring managers will not look at your resume unless there's a cover letter. So if they're not asking for, so if they're asking for a cover letter, don't think you can skip it. If they're asking for it, you have to have a cover letter or they're not gonna look at your resume. If they don't ask for a cover letter and they only have a section that's saying, submit your resume here in that little box, then just put in the resume. Um, but a cover letter can be very helpful to you. So there's nothing wrong with adding a cover letter even if they didn't ask for it. They're not easy to write, but I'm gonna give you also a link to a couple of um, cover letter templates that uh, finally I found templates that I really enjoy. So I'll, I'll share those with you too. So what is a cover letter? It's a sales letter. You're, you're selling yourself to a company for a particular position, not just I'm David Robbins and here's my bio. I have, you know, 25 years of experience doing this and 15 years of experience. They don't care about that, right? You're selling your skills, accomplishments, your enthusiasm, and your personality as it relates to this position for this company, which you learn from your analysis when you're preparing your resume. Now, the ad advantage of a cover letter in these last two words, in a resume, you can put in your skills and your accomplishments. It's hard to put in your enthusiasm and your personality for this particular position. So um, your cover letter gives you an opportunity to identify yourself a little more with your professional persona. Who are you as a professional? The cover letter focuses on two key points, why I want to work for you and what I can do for you. It's not simply, here's how wonderful I am, just like the resume. They don't care how wonderful you are. They care about what can you do for me and why do you want to work here? Again, that doesn't show up on a resume, but it can show up on a cover letter. And think about it, two people with exactly the same skill set, but one says, I'm really excited about working for your company. And the other one never mentions the company. I choose this person. So uh, the why I wanna work for you becomes an important point and you can add that into your cover letter. So you wanna focus on experience, education or strengths relevant to this position, not all of your prior experience. So that's what a cover letter is. Why do we use it? I mentioned this already. 40% of hiring managers want to see a cover letter. It presents more of your personality, your style. And I have to tell you for, for, organ, for uh, jobs that have to do with editors or writers or jobs in publishing, they want to see that cover letter because they want to see how you write. So those are things that are important. And the cover letter should state, this is the company I wanna work for and I have experience doing this job. So that's the bonus you get from a cover letter. So I did say the cover letter is not easy to write. Um, it usually takes me minimum an hour to write a cover letter and sometimes more than that because I, I keep reviewing it and tweaking it and tweaking it. I wanted to really make a statement about me and the job and the company. So the structure. Um, I would say it should be no more than two thirds of a page, uh, maybe three quarters of a page. And you don't wanna cram everything in. You definitely want to, just like on a resume, there needs to be white space, white space between paragraphs, short paragraphs and white space in between, margins, top, bottom and side to side. Uh, if you just have a block of black ink across the whole page, uh, they're not going to look at it. 
So um, you want to make sure that I, I, I recommend no more than three quarters of a page, but I prefer two, two thirds of a page. Um, you should deal with a standard font that is a sans serif. Um, Times New Roman is used a lot, but that has the serif, the little extra things. You know, a T looks like this, but it also has these little hangy things at the corners. Um, that just gets in the way. So Calibri, Arial, and there are a few others that, that are uh, without serif, sans serif. And that should be the same as your resume. So the font that you use in your cover letter should be the match to your resume. So it looks like they match. The structure, you have an intro introductory paragraph. You should include here how you found out about the position, particularly if somebody in their company referred you to this position, right? Uh, I'm excited to apply for this position as a corporate trainer that I, that I was referred to by Bill Smith, right? Because now they have no, okay, there's somebody that you know inside our organization or somebody in the industry that stands out. Very helpful right at the beginning, and then they're interested in reading the rest. Um, why you're interested in applying for this position. And then a very brief statement, maybe one sentence on what applicable experience you have. And that for me, I might say, I've been a corporate, uh, corporate instructor for over 15 years. The next paragraph two or maximum three paragraphs would be the cell. Right, since this is kind of a sales position, sales um, uh, document. Once you've introduced yourself, convey the details about why you are the best candidate. This is where you highlight your accomplishments using keywords from the job announcement and your analysis. So we already did the analysis. Now you know what keywords you need to cover and maybe pick two accomplishments that relate specifically to this job and put those into one paragraph, maybe two paragraphs. Then there's a closing paragraph. Here you again, stress how you will benefit the company with your skills or expertise and how you're really excited about working for this organization. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been reading about your organization and I noticed the uh, acquisitions that you're making. So I know you're in a growth mode and I'm really excited to grow along with your organization or add my value to your organization. I love words like value. I love passion. I love love, right? I love this organization. I love the way you do this or that. Your signature is simply your name. Now, this structure actually comes from writing a, a cover letter, but mostly you're gonna be sending your cover letter by email. Now, what some people do is they have pretty much a blank email and they attach a cover letter and a resume. Uh, there's a better way to do that. And that is to um, put, the put the body of the cover letter into the body of the email. So the email in essence is your cover letter. So, List your name and the job title in the subject line of the email message so they know who you are and what you're applying for. Include your contact information in your email signature, not at the top as you would do with a regular letter, but in an email, you usually have your contact information with your signature. Don't list the employer's contact information because you're emailing it to them. So they, they don't need to see that. Uh, skip the date because the email is already gonna have a date and start your email message with the salutation. Now, um, I don't think I have it here, but let me tell you about the salutation. Um, if you can find the hiring manager's name, dear Bill Smith. If you don't have the hiring manager's name, avoid to whom it may concern, or dear sir or madam. Those are outdated, they're not used anymore. A better uh, selection that you would have, a better choice would be dear hiring manager. Uh, if you know it's going to human resources, dear human resources. But um, stay away from to whom it may concern and dear sir, madam, 
if you can get the hiring manager's name, that would be great because then they could see that right at the top. The cover letter is the body of the email and mention that the resume is attached. So here are uh, two articles I thought were really helpful. One is two customizable cover templates for any job seeker um, by The Muse. The Muse is a great resource for a job search. They, they also post a lot of jobs that they know are open. So uh, this by going to this uh, link, you'll also get information about The Muse. And should you include a cover letter came from a LinkedIn podcast. And if you could read that, that also explains that it starts off with a, a, a recruiter saying, I never look at cover letters. They're a waste of time. And that's because most cover letters that this person sees are simply uh, talking about how wonderful they are or reiterating everything that's going to be in the resume. But if you follow the structure I just gave you and you talk about yourself and your, your, um, your wanting to work for this company in this job, it really is something that could help the recruiter think that you're a higher level. So two articles that could help you. OK, um, I'm going to take one or two questions about cover letters, if there are any. Yeah, there are a lot of question um, uh, prior to this section. Uh, you want a question only about cover letter, right? Yeah, let's talk about cover letters okay. first, and then we can go back to all okay. things at the end. Okay, sure. Let me find. Okay, so a question from uh, Harmony. Generally, the cover letter is not mandatory on the application websites, even though um, would you recommend to submit a cover letter? Yeah. Um, as you're reading these articles, your choice. If they didn't say submit your resume and cover letter, then you have a choice whether you think it's going to be helpful to you or not. Um, so that's up to you. If they say submit your resume and cover letter, don't skip the cover letter. Make sure that you submit it. Okay. A question from Emily. Um, how is all this information, all these paragraphs, uh, only in two thirds of a page. <laughs> Short paragraphs. <laughs> really, you want you, you want to be really concise. You're not you're not giving your res. They're going to look at your resume. Your resume is all the other information that they need. This is just something that says here's why I'm a good candidate. So one brief. I mean, the, besides the opening paragraph, the second and third paragraphs. One would be. Um, Here's experience I had doing this, which relates to what they're looking for. And then the next paragraph will be, and here's more experience I've had doing this other thing, which is what they ask for. Anything else, they'll go then to the, to the resume. Okay. So yeah, you're, you're, you're not there. Uh, a two page cover letter, I, I can pretty much assure you will not be read. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's actually a question for the library. Um, does the library offer cover letter review, same as resume reviews mentioned? Um, so um, I mentioned in the introductory slide that we have the BringFuse um, uh, job coaching. You can, um, in, in addition to submitting your resume for uh, review, um, you can also submit your cover letter and you can also do a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, session uh, with a, um, with a career coach um, uh, Monday through Sunday uh, from 1 to 10 p.m. Uh, so the answer is, is yes. And you can, uh, we also have um, in-person career coaching um, every Wednesday, 3 to 5 p.m. at the Ming Library. Um, so you can check our uh, library event calendar, uh, look for career coaching and make a reservation online to meet with the career coach in person in the library. And, and I wanna tell you that when, when our clients ask for a resume review, we ask them to submit the resume with the job description. We will not look at a resume without a job description because it's, it's not that meaningful. We want to make sure that the resume is targeted to the job description. So what we will do is do a very quick cursory analysis of looking for keywords. Then we're going to look at the resume and say, hey, I don't see any of these keywords. You never mentioned what the company does in your resume. So um, that's the way we do a resume review. We always 
um, unless, there, unless there's a particular situation, 90% um, of the resumes that we review and cover letters that we review, we need to see the job description so we make sure that they're targeted. Um, let me go on and just cover this as we're getting into the last half hour. Um, the applicant tracking system is something that used to be used only by very large companies. There is not one applicant tracking system. There are many companies that create applicant tracking systems and, and other companies license that applicant tracking system. They, they say what they're looking for in the job description, basically. And they, um, they then have all applications go through this applicant tracking system first. So let's talk a little bit about what it's about. Um, the applicant tracking system is used not only by large companies now, they're used by small companies, mid-sized companies. A lot of companies are using it because there are a lot of people who apply to jobs and they don't have any qualifications. So I have a couple of do's and don'ts for you. These are the tips. Um, do apply to roles that you're qualified for. How do you know if you're qualified for a role? Well, do the analysis. That was the first thing we talked about, right? What are the, what are the jobs that they want you to do? What are the duties and what are the requirements? If you can't do those duties and you don't have any of those requirements, the applicant tracking system is basically gonna kick you out if it's using filters because you're not qualified. So that's something that's gonna be really important. So companies use the ATS system because most candidates are not qualified for the position. Not just a few, most candidates that submit their resumes are not qualified for the position. And that's why they had to start using a, a robot to look at these before the human spent all their time. Now, not every company has filters. Uh, sometimes they use the applicant tracking system just to analyze, just by actually to track who's been applying to our company, to what kind of jobs. And they don't have filters, in which case the, the recruiter has a harder job because they have to look to see who they're eliminating. But the human is doing the same thing as the applicant tracking system. They're scanning, looking for the things they're looking for. It should kind of make sense. Okay, second bullet. If the posting is for an entry-level accounting position, the system will probably discard a resume from a dentist or a vice president to help the manager, right? That's, what, that's why they're gonna be able to look at these things and they're actually going to eliminate what they think is outside the parameters. If you're looking for an entry-level accounting position and you're, you're, all your experience is as a dentist, it's not gonna let you through. Analyze the job posting and only apply when you are qualified. So that's one of the do's. Second is include the right keywords. ATS algorithms aren't that different from human algorithms. We're all kind of skimming for the same things. So the ATS system looks for specific keywords like a Google search. Uh, look for the hard skills that come up more than once and mention you the top of the requirements and job duties. That's all part of that analysis that you did. If you do the analysis first, it's gonna help you put together a resume that's gonna get through the applicant tracking system. Put your keywords in context, a list of skills is a way that people try to trick the applicant tracking system. Uh, the applicant tracking system also, like a human, is looking for the skills in context, which means they're looking for accomplishment statements. So your accomplishments are unique to you. Your keywords are generalized. Humans want to see how you used your skills. Ensure your bullets are actually achievements. Use numbers and metrics to highlight your, your um, results. And don't just tell, I did this, but show. Um, I did this with these people doing this with this result. That's more of a show rather than just a tell. Also choose the right file type. I didn't mention this with resumes, but this is important. Um, some people will send in a, 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 a JPEG or a PNG because they're gonna take a photo of their resume. Um, some people will use, um, because they put this together in Google Docs, They'll use that format. Some will use, if you're a Mac person, you'll use a dot pages. It won't be read by the ATS system and many companies will not read a dot pages or a JPEG or a dot PNG. So if you, if you create 
your resume in that format, just export it and save it as a .docx or a .pdf. Um, those are the two contenders. Those are the ones that get through the system. PDFs are best to keep in your format, but docx format is the most accurately parsed by the, the ATS system. Definitely use the format that the company's asking for. If they say, submit your resume as a PDF, don't send it in as a docx. That says right away that you don't know how to follow instructions. Be careful of online resume builders because online resume builders have a lot of code underneath the text. So if you go to Microsoft and you go to Microsoft Word, it says use our resume format. That has a lot of kind of junk underneath that makes it look beautiful. It makes it very difficult to add or change things. And the applicant tracking system gets confused because it's reading all of that code, which it doesn't need to see. So stay with a doc file, stay with a PDF. If you like the format from Microsoft uh, Word, uh, copy the format, but start again with a new document in Microsoft Word, not Microsoft Word resume builder. So we recommend staying away from the resume builder. Make your resume easy to scan. Now, this is important because some people put columns. Um, the ATS system doesn't recognize columns. It reads right across from left to right. So if you have a column and another column, it's going to read the first bullet here and the first bullet here, it's gonna go right across. Now, if those both those columns are talking about the same thing, like um, here's a list of skills, doesn't matter which order, the ATS system reads them. But if one of your columns is about your experience and the other column is your contact information, it's going to mix those two things up and it's going to create a mess. So ATS systems are programmed to prefer chronological or hybrid combination resumes rather than functional. Recruiters also prefer those. Pure functional format without job history is not preferred by recruiters. So those are a couple of the do's. Here's some don'ts. Don't apply to tons of jobs at the same company. I really wanna work at, at, at Kaiser, so I'm gonna to apply to every different position I see, from janitor to, um, uh, to uh, web designer. Um, the applicant tracking system is tracking every application that comes through with your name, and it's gonna see that you're applying to everything. It's gonna give that signal to the recruiter. And now the recruiter doesn't trust, are you applying to this position? Which one do you have experience for? So um, it's okay to apply to two very similar roles, apply to both, tailor the resume to target each role, but don't just haphazardly apply to lots of jobs in one company thinking that's going to be helpful. If they use an applicant tracking system, it will actually knock you out. Don't apply to an entry level and a director level position at the same time. Uh, even even you know weeks weeks apart. Again, the applicant tracking system is going to tag that to the recruiter, saying, "I don't know what this person is looking for," and don't apply to a sales position, a video editing role at the same time, unless you really target each one with your experience and make them really look different. Okay, one more slide of don'ts. Don't try to trick the ATS. Uh, some people take a whole bunch of keywords put them in to the resume at the bottom, but they put the print as white. So when it prints out, you won't see that I tried to trick the ATS system. Um, the ATS system doesn't look at color. Everything is black and white. So when it prints it out for the recruiter, that whole list of skills at the bottom, usually inside the, uh, the bottom margin, is going to look really silly. Um, so um, ATS system will display all text the same color at the other end. You'll be labeling yourself as a cheater. And even if it gets through the system, um, the reviewer is going to get annoyed. Don't try to trick the ATS system. It's there for a purpose. Apply to companies that you are qualified for. There are lots of them, particularly in this period, lots of job openings out there. Look for the ones that you have a really good chance of getting. And avoid the fancy formatting. And the old days when we were sending in a hard copy, it was great to use colors, it was great to use columns, it was great to use icons. The ATS system doesn't recognize any of that. 
and the recruiter doesn't need it. It just gets in their way. So in order to scan for keywords, um, they will convert the document to a text only file and all of that fancy stuff will become corrupted. Avoid a few things. If you put information in a box on your resume, the ATS system won't read anything inside a box. So that's not gonna be helpful. So avoid uh, logos, avoid images. So some people put a telephone next to their phone number. You don't need that. People recognize what a phone number looks like and they know it's a phone number. So don't add these things thinking it's gonna look great. Uh, unless you're gonna be handing a resume in, that would be fine. But if you're sending it in, it might be going through an ATS system, which is just gonna corrupt all of that. Okay. Um, I think this is the last round of questions. Um, I do have a summary after this. So, um, David, we have a lot of questions, but only one that's related to ATS. Okay. Um, maybe we can we can answer this first, and then uh, the other ones. Uh, this one is from Angela. How many keywords to put in the top of resume for the employer's culture and eye-catching ATS? Um, the the ones that are most relevant. There's not, there's not, they're not counting. So the main thing is in the top of the resume, you are identifying yourself as a really good candidate. And it's not just listing keywords. Remember it's, it's listing um, something that tells them why you're a good candidate. So again, follow um, what we did with the example for UCSF and Samuel Hernandez. And the reason I, I put all that detail in there is so that you'd be able to go back to that you're going to get the slide set after this presentation and you'll get the video. So um, you'll be able to review that, but that's what you're looking to do. Okay, any, thank you, David. Any other questions? Um, other question, a question from Suzanne. When relevant experience is gained in business that closed, should we put this on our resumes? If you work there and you had experience, definitely put it on the resume. Uh, just because a company closed has nothing, doesn't mean you didn't show your wonderful uh, accomplishments. So yeah, there's no, no problem with that. They'll look for the company and they'll realize it's closed, but that's not, that's not on you. That's, um, that's just because the company closed. I, I just see a new question. It's about ATS. Um, it's from Pam. Um, David, you say don't use headers or footers for the ATS. Where should your contact information be on page two of resume if not in the header? Uh, in, the, in the very first line, just, just, a, just a simple line. It would just have um, on, uh, uh, left justified would be your name. In the middle might be your phone number. And then right justified would be your email address. That's it. And then it should say page two. Sorry, that would be good too. Okay, going back to non-ATS question, question from Mary. Uh, are there any pandemic or post-pandemic changes to resumes preferred by recruiter and hiring managers? Not that I know of. Everything I'm giving you now is what our recruiters are looking for today. Not, not pre-pandemic different and post-pandemic different. It's, Still, it's still all pretty much the same. Um, the only differences are over the years, they're really looking for your LinkedIn address because I would say 90% of companies are gonna look at your LinkedIn profile um, either before they look at your resume in detail or after they decide you're a wonderful candidate, they're still gonna go to your LinkedIn profile. Thank you, David. A question from Aaron. I've hopped across different roads and industries. If I'm creating a unique resume for each job, my relevant experience will be short. Would you recommend adding in less relevant experience in order to fill the gaps and show the path I've taken? Um, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about chronological resume, you're going to put in the jobs that you've had in chronologically. It's just that I wouldn't put six bullets of non-relevant experience under that job, I would list the job and one bullet that shows transferable skill. So experience that, I mean, for example, if you were a great collaborator, 
almost every job would love to have people who are collaborators. So in that job, even though it wasn't in the, in the same uh, career path, but it had collaboration, I would just make sure you include that bullet for collaboration or communication. So one or two bullets on the ones that are not as relevant, and then try to make your, uh, your bullets close, as close as you can. But definitely don't, don't skip something because you say, well, I, that, that doesn't relate to what we're looking for now. Because uh, chronologically, they, they want to see what you did chronologically. And the fact that you try different things doesn't necessarily uh, knock you out. Some recruiters like that. They would go, whoa, okay, this person's bringing a lot of ancillary experience to the job, which is what they would like. Okay, thank you, David. Question from Catherine. Does it make sense to put courses from Udemy, Gale, or MOOC in a resume? Or these platforms are unimportant for managers' per perspective? Okay, if you have room in your, in, in, and particularly if they provided certifications, because Udemy does, um, and uh, Coursera does, um, LinkedIn says anything you, any course you finish in LinkedIn learning, they consider it to be a certification. They're not really, but um, if you have room, you might even have a sec separate section that says certifications. But remember, only include the courses that are relevant to this new job that you're applying to. Um, the fact that you did something in horticulture, but you're applying for you know something that's not in horticulture, then don't don't put that course down. Um, you can include all of your courses in your LinkedIn profile under courses or certifications because they're gonna look there anyway. And if they're interested, they'll go looking, looking for those. But yes, I would put down courses that are in fact, doesn't matter who taught them. Um, if they are things that are relevant to the job you're applying to, I would include them under your education section or in a separate certification section. Thank you, David. Question from Gabrielle. Now that LinkedIn offer a few new options for the wording for some of these so-called gaps around pregnancies, uh, perhaps the same wording could be included on a resume? A absolutely. Yeah, LinkedIn LinkedIn's not making stuff up. Um, I, we work very closely with LinkedIn. As a matter of fact, I have a lunch today with, with my contact at LinkedIn. Um, uh, they're doing that because they know that people have gaps and they wanted to figure out a way to add that into your LinkedIn profile. But yes, the similar wording. Um, and then when I saw one of my clients use the word sabbatical, I thought, you yeah, know, that's great. Because um, sabbatical is understood by everybody as taking a break from. Um, so I think that's great. But remember, Whatever you did during that gap, and I'm, I, I just started learning about that LinkedIn, a uh, new LinkedIn feature. Um, whatever you did during that break in your, in your LinkedIn profile, it could be anything. But in your resume, make sure you're trying to pick things that show transferable skills that would be useful on the job. Okay, I have time for one more question, then I want to cut close it down. Okay, a question from Lily. Um, how do you work on yourself when you get the actual interview and you're one of those individuals who has a hard time talking about yourself and accomplishments and even finding answer to question asked on a spot? Any resources on this? Practice, 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 and practice. Uh, we encourage, first of all, we do a lot of it during our cohort in the two weeks. Um, we build the power of cohort so people now are, feel safe working with one another. And then we tell people, that you should uh, do your job search with accountability buddies. So find one or two other people to work with. And when it comes to preparing for a, an interview, um, have your accountability buddy interview you using the job description, asking you questions that relate to that job and have you practice, 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 practice. Uh, also working with the career advisors at, at BrainFuse or the ones that are live at the library. Uh, or sign up for our next cohort in May, and, and we work on that. Our first week is focused on resume. The second week is focused on preparing for an interview. And then we do a mock interview with um, corporate volunteers. And then in the year that we continue supporting our clients, 
we have a lot of mock interviews. So there are a lot of them available. If you look at the library, but also look at Eventbrite, they'll tell you when there are um, programs available and, and activities available for you to go in and practice your interviewing or practice doing resume review and other things. Okay, I'm going to take us past this last question and into a reminder of what we covered. So resume. Key point, each resume should match each job description or job posting, and it should be easy to read. It should actually should be easy to scan, which means white space and have those keywords. Don't bold the keywords, by the way. I just heard from one of our recruiters saying, they just got a resume where the person bolded all the keywords. Um, that's, that's only distracting to them. What they're interested in is for you to explain what you did in your experience. Cover letter, no more than one page and make sure your keywords are in there. And the ATS system, again, what you did your analysis for your resume, that'll help you get through the ATS system if you write your resume, according to that analysis, use the keywords from the job posting and apply to jobs you are qualified for. So all of this is available um, with JVS. We have a number of programs that are available for uh, technical training, for healthcare training, for bookkeeping training, for IT support training. And then we have the, the Job Search Accelerator program, which is industry agnostic. We don't care which in industry you're coming from, but we're looking to help people accelerate their job search in a two-week program. So in, in getting this slide set, you also get my contact information. Uh, if you're going to um, actually want to connect with me on LinkedIn, Make sure when you um, invite me to connect with you on LinkedIn that you add a note explaining to me why you want to connect with me. Because I get a lot of people who just say, mechanically, uh, they hit the connect button and um, I, I don't know who they are and I don't know why they want to connect with me. I only connect with people who I know or have a reason to connect with me. Um, and that's it. I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much for the questions, by the way. It's always good to get a way to clarify what I'm trying to cover. Um, and hopefully I'll see you at the 50 plus or one of the LinkedIn presentations that I continue to do here at the library. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate you taking the time to share with us um, some very valuable job search tips. I also want to thank everyone for joining. I hope you find the presentation informative and helpful to you. Um, I'll send out an evaluation survey together with David's slide deck and a link to the recording. Uh, later this afternoon, please give us your feedback so we can continue to improve. Again, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.